Good, good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 19th Board of Selectmen meeting. My name is John Arena. This is our third in a series of budget meetings in the month of December. The last will be tomorrow night. These meetings are being conducted in part to provide greater transparency and back background for those interested in what elements make up our town and school budgets and what that means in terms of next year's spending. Tonight's discussion will surround the subject matter of capital and debt, um, specifically facilities, performing co performance contracting results, discussion on Killam School Building Project, a discussion on RMHS athletic capital projects, benefits and other miscellaneous discussions. With that, I will turn to my right for Selectman Liaison's reports and Andy. Um, just one, John. Uh, I, I spoke with the chair of the Climate Advisory Committee and I believe, if I recall correctly, they're due to sunset this month. Is that correct? No, I don't think we, so. We no, extended them. we extend it until next year? Did we extend them two years? I'm not sure. It's, it's as soon as it would be, I think, it's next year. Okay. All right. So they don't they don't know. Should be on the website. I'll check. I'll follow up. Uh, yeah, it's in our minutes also. All right. Oh. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Barry. A uh, couple of things, Mr. Chair. Um, Thursday night I attended the uh, trust fund commissioners meeting, um, and I'm actually pleased to report that at that meeting, um, the trust fund has agreed to fund Ricasa's interface program to the tune of $4,000. Mm -hmm. um, this will allow that program to continue another year. Um, for those of you who recall, recall when Erica McNamara came in last week to talk about some of the work that is doing, one of the programs that they've, um, that they've funded through William James University is called the Interface Program, which basically um, it allows folks um, who are dealing with any kind of social, emotional, um, psychiatric, um, doesn't have to be necessarily opioids, um, to basically access a call line, talk to a, uh, a certified clinician who will then organize, um, through the person's insurance, different uh, folks that will take their insurance and get them an appointment right away. Otherwise, most of the folks who have ever had to wait on hold a million times to access to see if your doctor will take it to get an appointment, these folks already kind of do that work for you. So it allows people to get in a lot quicker and as you as you know a lot of these issues are very very time sensitive so to date uh, Erica I reported to the trust fund as she reported here that um, there have been 60 families um, uh, that have been actually accessed that program with tremendous success so um, we're able to fund that program now for another year um, going forward as you as you also know Erica talked about really their grants running out um, so the ability to kind of piece together other sort of funding sources is really critical. Um, the part about the trust fund which makes it a little tricky is that as you also know through the trust, uh, through the hospital trust fund, they really need to be able to demonstrate that they are working with needy people. That program doesn't necessarily, does a, a means test, so it's really difficult um, to kind of see, you know, what percentage of people are, um, who are accessing the program um, are actually you know, low or moderate income. So that's something that Eric is going to try to work on to see if they can gather that information um, on the intake. But um, you know, the trust fund as a use of sources for some of those things is, um, while it's a great source, um, it's um, it's not necessarily going to be a be all end all because of the fact that they do have that low income kind of provision. But we're good for another year. We'll figure it out next year. So that's all. Thank you, Barry. Dan, uh, I'll just announce this, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the board and the school committee. Uh, meeting jointly with the remaining members of the school committee, the selectmen and school committee members unanimously appointed Sherry Vanden Acker to fill the uh, vacant seat uh, vacated by Gary Nyan on the school committee through April 3rd, 2018. Thank you, Dan. John? I have nothing to report. Thank you, John. Uh, any public comment before we move on? Okay. Bob, any opening comments? Um, just to that last point. 
the charter, Sherry, in order to accept the school committee appointment, must resign as library trustee. So we have she will again. do that. Um, once she does, we need to advertise for a library trustee and go through a similar process. Right. The trustees and the selectmen will sit jointly to appoint someone. I don't remember that happening in, in quite some time. Uh, but I did uh, correspond with Amy today, and they're highly aware of that, and they're drumming up some interest. Good. Good. Thank you. And they do want to fill the seat uh, yes. before the election. Okay. Yes. Good. With that, we'll turn the discussion to the FY19 budget review and the subject of facilities. Joe? If I, if I could just uh, introduce how we're going to do tonight. Um, Joe uh, Huggins is our facilities director. Kevin Cabuzzi, our assistant facilities director, are going to discuss the facilities budget. That's clear, clean enough. Um, then Superintendent Doherty and myself are going to uh, cover shared costs, things that are split between the town and the schools. And uh, John is particularly going to focus and, and give some information out on Killam that he's previously given to the school committee. Joe? Thank you, Bob. Hello, everybody. Um, tonight we're going to go through the FY19 facilities budget. Uh, first slide here up on the screen will give you a look at our, our request for FY19 um, for the town facilities budget. We're looking at an overall increase of 7.35% and a 0.82 percent increase in the core facilities town facilities is the budget for the custodians on the town side as well as the cleaning contracts and the custodial staff that does cleaning of the town buildings the next um, group down from that is the salary lines which uh, for the town facilities budget is a 5.1 percent increase and a 5.1 percent increase on the core facilities and that uh, is largely made up of step increases and collective bargaining which is built into that below that the expense lines for the town facilities budget is up 13.61 percent uh, that is due to a contractual obligation for contract cleaning um, for the town buildings we entered into a new with a new contractor <coughs> halfway through last year and this represents a full year of uh, cleaning under the new contract and we haven't uh, great success with that um, company uh, on the core facilities uh, expenses they're down 0.15 percent um, I'll explain as we go further into that there were some one-time expenses in our budget to do some project work this year uh, in the town buildings and there was that came out of the budget as far as uh, full-time employees of the facilities department in the core facilities department which is uh, made up of um, four tradespeople and three office staff that is the same this year request as last year S seven total employees and on the town facilities which is made up of four custodial staff that do clean the town buildings along with outside contractors it's unchanged for FY19 so no additional This next slide here just shows everybody what the breakdown in square footage is that we maintain. Uh, the 17 buildings, just under 1.1 million square feet of space. Just to give you an idea, there's around 85% of the square footage lives on the school side and 15% on the town side. Cleaning of all the buildings, um, it does mention that cleaning of the buildings is accomplished with um, school custodians on the school side. We, we manage a staff of, that, that falls under the school uh, facilities budget, which is, we're not discussing that tonight. We do manage a staff of 18 school custodians that clean the school buildings, and um, the maintenance staff, the core maintenance staff, travels throughout all the town and school buildings and maintains all the buildings in the town of Reading. Nineteen twenty four, okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. This next slide just talks about our um, department mission and when our main focus in the facilities department is to support the town uh, with you know the educating of the um, the students as well as to um, support the municipal functions of the town of Reading uh, by maintaining clean and safe buildings for the town of Reading. And that includes maintaining the capital plan executing the capital plan, uh, doing work orders, day-to-day uh, -day work orders that are in all the buildings, as well as our, pre our preventive maintenance program, which I'm going to get into deeper as we go further. This is a quick uh, look at our organization chart. 
Again, we, myself, we have the assistant director. He handles all the maintenance of all the town and all the school buildings, the technicians out back and outside contractors, facilities manager who we work is a school department employee who works with and runs all the school custodians, and a rentals coordinator that is a school department position, but I thought we should mention that. It's in our office that does all the rentals for the town, for the schools, I should say. I know last year we talked a lot about this. This is just a, a flow chart on the different technology we use. Um, we've added a few different modules this year. We, we heavily use technology to run our department through energy management, work, order, work orders. Um, everything is on a program that uh, enables users to log in and request <coughs> work to be done in the buildings. It also has a preventive maintenance module that we use heavily to maintain all of our buildings. Uh, utility tracking software, which I'm going to get into also. Um, facility scheduling automation, which we've launched in the last two years. <clears throat> that actually, when our rentals person puts a rental in, it'll actually occupy the space so that we optimize start and stop times in all of our buildings. And we also employ something called critical alarm automation that will also alert us if there's any kind of boiler failure, low temperature in a building, which is critical this time of year. We monitor the, you know, the PD, any of the, the data center, things like that to make sure that things are running the way they should be. This just gives you an idea of some of the information we can generate from our work order in our um, print of maintenance pro program. And this is utilities right here. This gives you an idea water and sewer usage in gallons by square foot. If you look across the chart and you go down to the end, you look at, you can see Coolidge, Wood End, Senior Center, and Town Hall. Coolidge and Wood End are higher cost because those two, those two buildings have irrigation that we provide irrigation for, so they are, they are higher. The Senior Center this past year has been getting used even more and more. I'm sure you've been hearing that. We do a lot of rentals over there, and that building is in full swing, as well as the Town Hall. If you look at the schools, you're going to see that it's pretty consistent across the board on the water and sewer charges, the water and sewer usage, I should say, by square foot. This next slide right here talks about, speaks to electricity usage in our buildings. Um, and if you look at, like, the, uh, the Reading Police Department, again, this past year, you see this, this, there was a lot of activity over at that building. The town's, uh, a lot of the town's infrastructure lives over there. Town hall, a lot of meetings going on over there. But this gives you an idea of where uh, kilowatt hour use per square foot at the different locations. And again, the schools, if you look at the use, overall it's pretty flat as far as what we're using because we heavily employ the energy management in all the buildings, run times and things like that. So is there more air conditioning uh, at a foot at the senior center town hall? Police department is it? The police department is fully air conditioned, yeah. and the senior center is also. Uh, to explain in town hall, yeah. Uh, this next slide is is in therms for natural gas, and if you look down, you can see the DPW garage uh, for FY17 was um, pretty high usage, and um, in speaking with the DPW folks, we had 25. Um, sanding and salting operations over there, the seven snowstorms, mm -hmm. and not to mention all the daytime activity that goes on with, with them just operating the DPW during the normal winter. Um, so that's why you're seeing that spike, and it'll, I'll speak more to that as we go further to, through the report. Joe, why would the, the West Side Fire Station have such high uses compared to the uh, Main Street? Per it's square smaller. foot. Per square foot. Um, this isn't used. It's this normalized. is used normalized by square foot. It's just a little, it, it, it's... Is it just less efficient? It's an older building. It's an older building. That could be part of it. It's interesting. Look at the library. Brand new construction. Now, maybe that's only part of the year that you've got measured, uh, but yeah. on a normalized basis. Just so you know, the, the library, it, it flip-flopped. <coughs> right now, we only have a... How many BTUs is the boiler here? One million. One million BTUs. We used to heat the whole building with natural gas. Now it's the other way around. The electricity consumption is higher. Higher per, than the heating. Exactly. So <clears throat> at town meeting, we were, this is kind of confusing. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Your eyes will roll back in your head if I keep talking. The, 
I was asked the question about what we what we did for um, for our performance contract initiative back in 2009, and this chart shows the different energy conservation measures that we did at each location. If you go across the top, you can see the conservation measure, where it was employed, and then what location it was employed at. This project pulled off, and Bob, could, you can correct me, it was probably around $3 million worth of capital off the capital plan with everything we did. Um, I thought it was five. I think it was more. It was a $5 million project, but it was, I think, it, it was, it was a quite a bit of capital that came off, which You'll see we're kind of light, we're light on the amount of capital in the mechanical work we're doing now. There's a few things coming up because we did it all under this project. Um, you know, buildings that really benefited from this, um, one of them would be like the, um, uh, the Joshua Wheaton Elementary School, um, the, um, well actually, I'm sorry, the Birch Meadow. The Birch Meadow got brand new condensing boilers over there, which is huge. That's a huge energy savings over there, new air equipment. We did new unit ventilators. We did, that was a steam to hot water conversion we got done under this project. Everybody got lighting improvements, lighting controls, domestic hot water, um, energy management across the board. The only building we really didn't do was the DPW. Um, weatherization was at most of the locations. Um, and then solar domestic hot water we employ at the police and the two fire stations. Um, so this was a great thing and I have my next slide is going to show you some of the savings that were generated from the project. Joe, will you cover um, potential future conservation steps that you envision, or is that, is that part of this? One of the th it's not part of this, but one of the things we've been talking about is doing an, L an LED project. When we did this, the LED technology was really new, and um, it, it, it didn't have a good payback, but things have right. changed substantially, so we, we have talked about that. Um, we did do an LED conversion at Town Hall of all the common area lighting and Joshua Eaton. All the hallway lights and, and we Joshua did, Eaton. yep, and we took advantage of a rebate through RMLD for both those projects. So, so this slide right here is going to, is basically showing you, if you look at the baseline period, these are town buildings we're talking about. So the baseline is when they came in and that was our consumption, the first first column right there in kilowatt hours and then the performance period which was August of 16 through June of 2017 so if you look at the reduction it's 93,439 uh, kilowatt hours savings the police station if you look didn't do so well but there's been a, there's a there's a lot more activity in the police station now and there's a lot more equipment in that police station that's being maintained which drives the electricity up but the the message here, though, is that the consumption is down. It's 93,439 kilowatt hours down. The demand is also down, too. Demand is a tough thing to, to sort of do in a, to, to manage in municipal and school buildings because you really can't shut school and they want you to be able to, we, we do it by staggering start times on our equipment. So our demand charges based, you know, the, a lot of the charges come from that, but we try to limit that and keep that cost down by starting up equipment, staggering start times in all the buildings when we're running it. Even in the winter time, we won't start the whole building up at once. It'll come on one part at a time. Um, the gas usage in therms, the big one, as you can see from the, you know, the DPW didn't uh, hurt, help us this past period. But that's nothing we can do about that. Um, what we are doing to battle that this year is we have some capital money and we're going to install some um, timers on the overhead doors and all the um, shops on the front of the building just like we did on the others so we're hoping by doing that when there is heavy use at the building that the, the doors will automatically come down that's where you lose a lot of the heat at that location sure, but we didn't do any improvements at the garage we did we did new sterling units in the garage over there which are the two giant heaters that heat the high bay garage out there yep but that's just driven this is this is weather weather related uh, spike and then you can see the, um, the water and sewer use in, in gallons is, is down also. On the school side, we've done really well. I mean, the school side, you know, we've saved um, in electricity 2,241,000 2, mm -hmm. <coughs> kilowatt hours in, in, in um, electricity. Our demand is also down, which is great. 
um, our use in therms, again, is down, and our water and sewer is down. Overall, in a total town and school picture, if you add them up, the savings is 3.3 million kilowatt hours over the baseline, 168,000 therms, and 2,139 um, in water. So yeah, we have that, done what well. Does that, what does that translate to in dollars? My question is that. <laughs> you knew you'd ask. Well, we spent $5 million that we didn't really well, have to spend. We're spending we about 400000 a year in debt service on that. Okay. Um, in addition, what Joe was saying earlier is there was some amount, let's say $3 million of planned capital that didn't need to get done because it was done as part of the project. In a sense, that's saved. So it's a $2 million net. Um, well, you, you did $3 million all at once that you would have done, and you did another $2 million that you maybe didn't plan on to start. It's costing you four hundred thousand dollars a year, and we're saving about seven hundred fifty thousand plus or minus. And if you really study it, what the objective was, in addition to saving money, is we shifted savings into the operating budget for the town and the schools. So that's where the savings is, and the spend is in the capital plan, which you spend five percent a year anyways. No big deal. But you know, it's it's freed up uh, three quarters of a million dollars on as that's a rough big. number uh, annually. So it begs the question: Is is there um, is there like a um, uh, performance contracting too out there? Maybe not just the lights that you talked about, but something. I mean, it's clearly. Yeah. I mean, here's something. You know, we talk about tax dollars being used, and what's the benefit? You just quantify in dollars yeah. and cents, not value or services. Mm -hmm. Dollars and cents. You spent a dollar, and you saved a lot. So. You know, does it make sense to look at doing this again for things that we didn't touch? One of the, one of the reasons we didn't, my reason, selfishly, is we were too busy with the, this building. Um, you know, Joe, as the project manager, is flat out. Um, I'd say now it's it's an opportunity to look at it again. Um, I know some of the break-evens that were mentioned in 09 were, you know, 50 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. the, the windows window, were a long windows. payback. And I know it? that that has shortened up. Mm -hmm. So I think a town should generally look at this stuff every, you pick the number, 10 years, 20 years, I don't know, uh, as a matter of course. But I also remember um, there was a small group doing the performance contracting process. It was intense work. Right. I was married to Lia at the time, was leading it, Joe and I. Um, there was a substantial amount of work involved, so you don't necessarily want to do it too often. Well, yeah, I mean, you had to do the work in the summer for the schools when they were. I mean, I remember it was it was a big. The mm -hmm. process of selecting a vendor was pretty intense, mm -hmm. uh, and then choosing what to do, because you know we got a list of I don't know I'll say ten million dollars worth of improvements and chose to do five. It was ten. I remember it yeah. was ten. And yeah. in retrospect, maybe we should have done the ten, but uh, <laughs> maybe it's now more cost effective. Yeah. yeah. But, so yeah, we should look at it. Joe, are, are any of our buildings, I'm sorry, Baron, did I cut somebody off? No. Go ahead. Are any of our buildings still steam at this point, or are they all hot The water? West Side Fire Station and Pot of Coolidge. Sorry. Yeah. Are those candidates to try to change, to change over? Coolidge would be a, a, a really big project to do that. We have talked about looking into doing that. It's just that it's the new section of the building is... The new hot, section is hot water. Hot water and the oldest steam. Um, and a couple of the... A couple of the rooftop units, the one that serves the gym and the one that serves the multi-purpose room are also hydronic, but the rest of the building is still steam. It's not the most efficient system in the world, the steam no. system. No. Thank you. I'm sorry, Andy. Um, Bob, so if I understood the numbers correctly for this project, the debt service is about $400,000, the savings are about $750,000 a year, so we're netting around three fifty. dollars Paul Park, yeah, it's close. Roughly, yeah, yeah. So, yes. and, and so again, to good emphasize, the, the spend is in the capital side and the relief is on the right. operating right. side. Right. That's great. And there was a leap of faith back then. It's like, we hadn't no. done it. It was an educated leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, we, it, was, it, was, it was a risk, but it was, it was sort oh, of... Oh, yeah, there was no, I mean, they guaranteed a certain amount of savings. Right. So, in that sense... Which we exceeded. Yeah, which we exceeded. I don't think any of us knew how much we'd exceed it by. We might have had our private estimates. Um, I'd say we've done generally better than I would have expected. I don't know I mean, what other people think. During times of austerity, yeah. this, I mean, this is, this is a win. I mean, yeah. So.
I mean, you can look at the consumption now and say Reading is very efficient. Could we be better? You could probably always be better. But I'm sure this stacks up against most uh, schools and cities and towns. And now we know how to do it. Yeah. We didn't know how to do it before. Other towns have come and asked us about how what how our success was with this this project, and um, it's been successful. But one of the things I tell people, uh, North Andover, I, I'm from North Andover, and I talked to their town manager about it. I said, if you don't have a good preventive maintenance program, then this project is not something anybody wants to undertake, and that's the key to it because they do what's called measurement and verification, and it's over a 15-year period because normally it's a 15-year payback for everything. So if, as long as you're maintaining the equipment, you're good. But if you're not maintaining, it, maintaining the equipment, they won't guarantee the savings. So that's, that's the big thing. You have to maintain what they're putting in uh, and, and do it religiously. So. And, and Bob, the debt, the four hundred, the, the three hundred fifty, no, the four hundred thousand dollars a year it drops off. How long? I knew you were going to ask. So I'm flipping through. I'm <laughs> just trying to find it. <laughs> this is not orchestrated. One, two, three, four, five, six. Counting next year, seven more years. Yeah, we're in the ninth year right now. Question from the audience. Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Doctor. Um, one question you were talking, and I think Barry you brought it up too. The LED. Uh, Version now is very different. It might be something that's worth looking at. So, mm -hmm. in five or ten years, it's, yep. it's, it, the economics have changed dramatically. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Hi, Joe. Uh, great job, by the way. Thank you. Well, why don't you use the mic? They can't hear you on TV without the mic. <laughs> nice, nice job your presentation. My question was uh, my daughter's a kindergarten student at the Killer School, and that's why I was here. I thought we were going to talk about uh, renovations at the Killing School, but I understand. That's coming. That's coming. Okay. So, I guess talking about energy efficiency, is there any talks about entering in any more power purchase agreements, solar panels, all the roofs in town? Um, I can answer part of that. We've discussed for years with RMLD um, the prospect of solar. Um, for an opener, solar does not save you money in today's economy. <coughs> period. Um, the rooftops of our town and school buildings are not conducive to that generally. Um, my recollection from a few years back is that the best option at the time was some kind of a solar wall next to the field house, for instance. And there was little to no roof space available for the solar arrays that you would need. Um, we've discussed many other options, like at the high school, some kind of a carport, like is at uh, Endicott College. Um, you know, nothing, nothing strikes us as being an enormous savings. Um, it might be worth doing, uh, but it's not going to change the economics right now. And the light department is test, testing either one or two programs in Wilmington right now. I know one's on a roof of a private building. The other one I'm not sure if they've launched yet to see what the results are. So it's possible. Bill? Yeah. It could also be a fire hazard if you watch the news the other night. Any questions? Joe? So this next slide just gives you uh, an idea of um, FY16, we did 2,381 work orders and we've completed 20, we've completed 2,599 work orders uh, processed and that includes in-house and outsourced work orders. Um, we also added a few different locations to this <coughs> athletic fields, Lions Den, and Rise Preschool. We split that out from the high school to track it. But you can pretty much see where the work is going on um, in all of uh, the town and the school buildings. Just to give everybody an idea, um, we just did a rundown today on, on, on the equipment that we do maintain. Um, and this is, this is stuff that's in our preventive maintenance program. We maintain 54 boilers in the town of Reading, 300 plus unit ventilators, which are in all the classrooms of, in all the school buildings, 150 plus fan coil units, which you find in hallways and vestibules, 305 exhaust fans, 80 rooftop units, which is air handlers and RTUs, 200 miscellaneous pumps and compressors, 45 split systems, 14 elevators, 5 lifts, 15 alarm systems, and 97 roof systems and windows. We've been putting windows in as we've replaced them in different locations. This is stuff that just is, this is what we have in our preventive maintenance program system-wise that we maintain for the town. 
No partridge in a pear tree? No. <laughs> <laughs> this next slide right here just gives you an idea. We Last year we added a, an additional, uh, two years ago, well, no, it was last, last year, year. It was last year, we added an additional carpenter with the purpose of freeing up our electrician and plumber from doing general trades work so that they could go out and do diagnostics on some of the bigger stuff to save us money. We've gone from 68% in-house mm -hmm. to 73% of in-house work, which has lowered the amount of billable hours that are coming in from outside contractors, because those guys are doing what their core, their core mission is, which is plumbing and, ele and electrical. Is that the percent of work orders or the percent of the dollars represented? Work orders. What if, what if it were dollars? I could figure that out and get back to you guys. It's just a clear demonstration of the way that you're, you know, working towards efficiencies and economies, Joe. I, I think this is spectacular. I mean, you know, to drill down to the exact dollar amount is maybe an exercise that you don't need to consume yourself with this second, in my opinion. I mean, the point is, we know we're paying a lot less every time it's an internal work assignment as compared with the one that's, you know, sent out for billable hours outside I mean, right you know exactly uh, by a by a l large margin and it's that prevailing wage which is substantial yeah. correct exactly when i go into my next slides we're going to talk about you know the breakdown of the budgets but <coughs> there are some things that we're on the hook for that we have to do and then i'm just going to read them to you guys it's like fire suppression we're mandated by state law to have that done uh it's inspections fire alarm three times a year elevator sprinkler fire pumps Boilers are mandated by our insurance company to do an ex external inspection and then an internal every three years. And then every year we have the fire department and the building inspector go through all of our buildings and give to get our occupancy for the upcoming year. Mm -hmm. And so these things are all <coughs> built into our budget to maintain the buildings that we have to do. This, and not to mention the preventive maintenance, which is stipulated maintenance of all the equipment to maintain it and to keep it running properly. So this next slide just gives you folks a quick look at the town facilities budget. I mentioned that the salaries are up 5.1%. That's the breakout right there. And the town building expense line is up 13.61. It's an overall increase of 7.35%. But like I said, it's largely due, mostly due to the, um, the cleaning services that we talked about in the town, in the town and school buildings. I mean, sorry. The, the town buildings. So that's the breakout right there. This next slide shows the uh, the core facilities budget. Those are contractual, all those cleaning services, right? So we're, once we're in, we're in. We're in. And you said it was just renegotiated, or we just what, got into we, the We got into the contract with them mid-year in 17. And th so that was a half year, and this is a full year we're in right now than next year. So it's it's obviously a, a big jump. Are, are are we getting more than we were in the old con I mean we're paying more obviously, but are we getting more? We're getting more. We added more scope to this building right here because the building got larger. Um, we also added more scope to the police department um, and some in days of service at a couple uh, two other locations I believe. Mm -hmm. So can you draw a differential between <coughs> that cost and I mean, if you were hiring full-time employees to do all that work, mm -hmm. I mean, it's much cheaper to do it. Be. It's much cheaper to, to outsource it because yeah, you're not right, paying so the, that's the fringe point, benefit. Exactly. exactly. Even though, it, you know, it appears to be driving, you know, an out-of-sync percentage compared to what we take in. When it when you match it to actual cost, mm -hmm. it's uh, my guess is it's a it's a fractional number of what it would cost with all those employees. Mm -hmm. I think a, 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 a full-time person for the cleaning company, if we hired one, would be around thirty thousand dollars a year, and I would, and we would not be able to pay a full-time an FTE that kind of money, and they're doing it with total number of people, like five people, roughly, to On do the it. Town side. Yeah. 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 Uh, Joe, as we go forward into FY uh, twenty twenty one and beyond, uh, would we expect some? Diminishment in that 5.1 percent annual increase. I would think we would. I'll, I'll answer that. Sure. Um, Dan, for the both wage lines, if you notice the largest increase, um, well, you, 
I guess it's not obvious, it's union. Maintenance um, we're shifting from a school calendar to a town calendar, which is less days off. Okay. That's something we have to negotiate in the first quarter next year, and that's the reason they're a little higher is effectively you have to, we have to buy some time off. Right. So that settle and out? From then on, it'll be normal. In the 3% yep. range? Yep. yep. Call the finance committee to work. Thank you, Peter. So this is the, again, this is the core facilities budget, which um, the salaries are up 5.1%, which Bob just explained. Same thing on the core side. Uh, and the expenses are down 0.15%. And you're going to see this, there's some movement around in the lines, and uh, there was a reduction in our, um, our other repair <coughs> and other maintenance and repair line, which we move money out of that line to fund the line for ice melt, which we weren't tracking before. We provide ice melt for all the town and school buildings, and we want to be able to track how much we're spending. And there were some one-time expenses in the budget, a total of $60,000 that came out. Um, and even with the increases in the utilities, it's only a 0.15. It's, it's down 0.15%. Yep. Joe, could you back up one slide, please? I'm not sure. Um, there. Right there? Yes. So that jump again is a custodial service? Correct. Yep. All right, thank you. So this next slide right here, it we, we thought it would be helpful for folks to see with the breakdown. Um, but in school versus town, um, you can see what our electricity, <coughs> natural gas, and total utilities um, request is for FY19, and then our expenses. Any sense of how much that 3.89 is price and how much of it is volume? a good question. That is a good question. No. Okay, just curious. Are you just paying more for the same or are you using Generally, more? it's price, but I couldn't be precise. Joe, I know this has come up before um, town meeting and in, in, in other areas, but um, do we negotiate a preferred price with RMLD? Not that I know of. No. There was some discussion of a school rate. Mm -hmm. I don't honestly remember if that came to fruition. Student rate for electricity. <laughs> they want to sell off peak. Obviously, they want to sell off peak demand. Yep. Schools don't operate in the summer, so that's good. Right. But I, I couldn't honestly tell you how far that got. Is that worth kind of conversations? Um, Dan, we could bring that up when we meet in yep. January um, with the committee. It, we may have it. I don't know. I'm not saying we don't. I just don't know. Okay. This gives you an idea of what the town looks like from the same perspective. So can you go back one to go back one? You're okay having a smaller extraordinary repair on schools, taking 20K risk there? I think some of that was a one-time It was a one-time project. All right. Yeah, that was probably a one-time project. And I don't know for sure. Back up one. Okay. So both of those are running very lean. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the negative lean in both cases. So same story there. The FY18 budget is, is 81, but the town manager budget is 21 for the following year. So that must have been a one-timer. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm looking at other maintenance. Right. That's exactly right. That was That's a one-time. Okay. Mm hmm Bob, can you help me out here um, on the, the munis sheets that you gave us? Um, What's the easiest way to 
compare this to the slide? <coughs> or is that's there a, the, there, way? That's a really challenging <laughs> question. Okay. Um, I won't go into details, but the way the school department budget and the town budget are set up are differently. <coughs> it's very difficult to show the same format for facilities because of that as the yeah. rest of the town departments. Okay. So when we present the final product to town meeting and to FinCom, it's all scrubbed, if you will. So the thing in front of you is by building, which really isn't helpful for most people as opposed to by topic. Um, so there's no easy answer. Sorry. But, but it all ties out. No, no, it does all tie out. Yeah, but this okay. is the executive summary, pulling all of those yep. pieces in. Yeah, what you got is every account. gruesome detail of every line item that Joe tracks. You'd have to put in, you know. And this is the trend. And, and, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to make sure yep. I wasn't missing business. Yep. Thanks. So, so, Joe, is there anything different you wish you could do? Anything, you know, I know, I know you put in the same, you know, in terms of uh, FTEs and, and um, and staffing, are there like, you know? What's in there right now, what we're asking for is, like I mentioned, a lot of the state mandated things that we need to do, that we need to get done. There's a dollar value to that, and that's built in there to maintain the buildings. We would, we would love to be able to hire an HVAC mechanic that has some controls experience and has his licenses, but the market is so good right now, we just, you, you, we couldn't get anybody for what we're paying. And it's really not even worth even trying. We, we've, we've talked to, a, there's a few people that we've sort of talked to, but the money's just not there right now. If things change, we could, we could, uh, we could bring that in-house. We would save quite a bit of money, just like we did with the electrician. So. And, and also, too, can you talk about the relationship now between the facilities department and now we have a fully operational um, buildings committee? Mm -hmm. Are they, like, sort of doing, helping in terms of long-term analysis of our uh, our facilities and kind of recommendations are they are you working with them I am. not on a specific project but sort of overall on facilities and if you are can you talk about how you do that yeah so right now they're working um, on they've they've been working really hard on getting an assessment tool together that they can use to do assessments of all of our locations um, they've been through um, Killam Birch Meadow and the Joshua Eaton uh, in January, they plan on going back into Killam with the assessment tool to use that, and it's something that they're going to, because that was the first school they did, now they want to go in and, and test the tool out. Um, so they're going to use that to give, give the building a, a rating, um, if you will. And then the goal is to go through all the schools and then to extend that out to the town buildings. So Kevin and myself will meet with them once a month. We'll probably be meeting twice in January. Um, and it's been very productive. They're very helpful. There's a great uh, group of people that are on that committee. A lot of knowledge. And what's in the assessment tool is just sort of reading the building or reading its kind of useful. Yeah, my understanding is they were going to have like a, um, a a green, a yellow, and a red. <laughs> For that, you know, in, in that, in, but there'll be a narrative to it so people can look at the documents. So in 20 years from now, you can look at. Here's what we did at Killam. Here's what we did. I'm just using that as an example, but whatever, one of the schools, and they can they can say, here's where it is at this point in time, because it's really a point in time thing when they do an assessment, because things then, change. And then that can actually help focus and direct and shape the capital plan. So correct. Uh, we put the money where it's really needed faster. They've 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 looked at the capital plan. They've looked yeah. at our. We've talked to them. We actually did a demo for them on the. Um, on our utility track software, they wanted to see how that all worked. They wanted to see how the buildings were performing, um, and we, we got really good feedback. Um, they when they when the buildings they walked through, um, there was no oh my god moments in, in any of the boiler rooms. Or anything. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So it no was rats. good. No, it's good. But they're 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 uh, they they've got good information and they've got um, they're a great resource to us as a department. And that's a volunteer committee. Mr. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You, Bob and, and Barry, and for all of your knowledge, they meet in January. I, I know it's early. Is it the 9th or something, or 8th, maybe? Yeah, the 8th. Um, they're going to do a lessons learned on this on this building. Oh. And the project manager we hired, plus Joe, plus myself, plus the building committee, is just going to listen to stories of what could have been better, what went well, what didn't go well. So you know, we get that feedback loop. We wanted to wait about six months 
and think about things, especially with the project manager, and he's going to come in and tell his tale. So I think that'll be helpful. Especially They're very much looking forward to that. contemplate new buildings and right, yeah. uh, major rehabs of old, older buildings, right. those lessons learned are, say, yep. valuable to all. Yep. Yeah. We'll use <laughs> Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Elaine, you may have to come up. With, yeah. It's a really quiet room. No, but it might have had to do with how we were tracking the elevator expenses because in some cases we weren't putting everything under the elevator expense lines and we've oh, actually, other. yes. Okay. Um, I have a question about, and I might have missed it, um, and do you look at, do you evaluate like per square foot um, and compare any of the buildings or you know, any of the buildings across the town holdings to see, you know, if, um, if there's an efficiency that's different, I don't know if you look at the cost per square foot. Um, I guess was how you did you do, were you here when we were going over the uh, the Noresco? No, I wasn't. I was a little late, so I apologize. It's that. okay. No, I can pull it up for you. So, like, if you look at the um, on the schools, I have to pull that. I can't see. Um, buildings like the wood end it would be one I would talk about in terms of like consumption. Um, like how it performs, I guess, in general. Um, Let's just go to these ones, Joe. Yeah. Let's go back to your charts there, Joe. Yeah. You passed the large kilowatts per square foot. Oh, you mean you want to go? Okay. What was that? Which way was that? Backwards. Yeah, there you, there you go. go. Okay. There's natural gas. There oh, was, this oh, this okay. one right here might be more helpful. Yeah. Okay. I, I was also thinking about just the like maintenance. The maintenance, the amount of dolls that they're spending doing work orders in the buildings. Yeah, you got that um, to work that, that's useful to track yeah I mean we're tracking things like well to answer your question I mean if you look at these slides right here yeah. you can see what we're spending um, this is kilowatt hours per square foot for the different locations and it shows you where w what buildings are consuming the most in terms of that and you can see most of the schools are pretty consistent across the board you know natural gas that gives you an idea Right there, DPW garage is really high because of a you know of the amount of sanding and salting operations and snowstorms, um, and the activity that goes on down at that location. Um, in terms of like what was spending, what buildings cost the most to operate? Is that what you're asking me? Perform the routine and preventative maintenance. So the high school will be the most expensive building to run because it's it, the big. I mean, is it is it also the most expensive per square foot? Actually, no. It, it's actually not. And I, you know, I, I should have brought that slide. We had a, um, we did a, on our utility track program, I'd be happy to share it with you. We looked at that. The high school actually performs really well, believe it or not, in terms of what it costs to run per square foot. It's not extremely higher than the other buildings in terms of what it costs to run it per square foot, but there's the most mechanical equipment at that location, just to give you an idea. In that building alone, there's like 60 unit ventilators in that own, that building alone. So. Um, and I, d I just had one other. Sure. Um, so you were talking about the assessment that the building committee is, yep. is doing. Uh, but you you do constant and routine assessments of mm -hmm. all of our buildings. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want anyone to come away thinking that we haven't been assessing and monitoring the school buildings. Yep. And total building committee came along. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we, we, there are things that we do on, a, on a, not only with our preventive maintenance program, but we, we ourselves do inspections of the buildings and do our own walkthroughs to make sure that we're on track with certain things. Um, when they were walking the, the buildings that they did walk with us, they, could, they, they saw that we did have a robust preventive maintenance program in place. So there was no doubt that they, you know, we were doing everything we should be doing in the buildings. So. 
Thank you. Yes, Mark. Sorry. Hi, Andrew. Um, Hi, Mark. Can you go back to the software slide just for a second? And the question is, I know last year there were some modules you hadn't yet implemented but wanted to. At this point, are they all up and yes. running? Yes. They are. So utility track is up and running yep. now, um, which we can it's really good because we can look at our information like I just showed you folks on the uh, Noresco slides and we can verify that and match it up with our utility track program so, and it's really good we had a um, if we if we have a spike in a utility it'll it'll alert us when we're entering the bill so we're entering the bill in there um, for whether it's what commodity it might be water or sewer it'll tell you that this is much higher than this time last year so then that runs a red flag up so that's been launched the other one that was launched is the uh, facility scheduling automation, which ties the rentals into the um, into the energy management system. So these these modules are all talking to each other, which is great. I'm only half kidding and wondering that since you're teaching all sorts of other people how to do this stuff and how valuable it is, if that is a, a chargeable service. <laughs> Any other comments? <coughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Bill. Excellent job. Thank you very much. Um, while I get prepared for the next one, I can tell you that the Killam second graders take a tour of police fire town hall and our CTV pretty much every year that I can remember. And the only thing that's ever competed with police and fire is the utility track that Joe showed them last year. <laughs> um, when, when they saw that he could turn on and off the temperature in their teacher's room, they were fascinated. <laughs> and that's under lock and key at all times, I'm sure. Yes. And they can, Joe can almost work from home, but not quite. Um, John and I are going to talk about shared costs. Um, Specifically, John will cover Killam, and I'll do some other things. <coughs> as long as the computer wakes up. <coughs> First is energy, and, and Joe is really just giving <coughs> you a, an overview of um, the core uh, of facilities, rather portions. The other two pieces are street lighting and fuel in the DPW uh, department, which is centralized for town and schools. Uh, and as you can see, those are both down. Um, all these numbers are essentially unchanged from the fall financial forum. A couple of dollars here and there, but it didn't add up to even $2,000. I'm going to spend most of the time this evening uh, talking about capital and debt. Uh, the baseline of our capital plan right now is the one that was passed by November town meeting. Any changes we make will reflect a change from November. In FY19, <coughs> our debt service declines by just over $350,000 inside the levy. As you can see, there's a few projects that are being repaid, and no new debt is forecast. So there you can see the drop from 1.87 to 1.5 million. That's, that's part one. Part two is in FY19, the FinCom target of 5%. Um, has not been followed for the last few years. We've, um, if you will, allowed some money to go into the operating budgets because of our challenges. Um, I am proposing to reduce that amount almost in half from 280,000 to about 140,000. So about 150,000 new money, if you will, is freed up for capital if uh, FinCom and town meeting agree. Um, and I would propose to take step two in FY20 and restore the capital plan to the full 5%, by the way. Um, so that's a, an increase of 350. Uh, I guess the thing I didn't mention is just the growth of the overall budget raises the 5% target also. The 350 and the 150 and the 150 add up to 650,000, if I did my math right, of more capital spending just naturally uh, than it existed last year. There's... Um, this is the part where the community is often asked for discussion of long-term projects, large projects. Uh, right now, in the November capital plan, as approved by town meeting, uh, there is a series of infrastructure improvements, and those are in the general fund, water, sewer, and stormwater. Um, I have no idea what the costs will be, what the findings will be, 
The request for next year is $100,000 from each of those to do a study, to, to do some field testing. And then just purely picking a number out of the air, I've said a million dollars for each of those is going to be a planning tool for debt service. And that's in the capital plan and fully funded. The DPW building project, which is a very complex issue, is also fully inside the levy as currently proposed, uh, very much in draft form. Um, John and I and, and Joe and, and Chief Segal have discussed building security. We are going to make one recommended change, which is to move the dispatch center up a couple years in the capital plan and do that first. That's going to be essentially the hub of all building security, so we really don't want to start doing some building security improvements to the existing dispatch center and then find out we have to do something different. So the dispatch center is in the capital plan currently. We're going to suggest we move that up. Outside the levy, again, uh, John will talk about Killam School improvements. There is then the remaining building security improvements and uh, the athletic improvements in and around Birch Meadow and the high school. And just to keep it on your radar, uh, not yet planned or, or discussed really at any length, is the community center that you heard about um, when the uh, uh, UMass folks came in and talked about our senior population uh, sometime in the summer. Bill? Uh, uh, <coughs> well, who decides what's inside the living and what's uh, outside of the living? Uh, you as a town meeting member. <laughs> but who proposes it? Well, the town manager would propose it to the finance committee who would then propose it to a uh, town meeting. <laughs> to yeah. give you a little more detail on inside the levy on the things I just mentioned, um, Again, the start of the $400,000 of an assessment. Uh, this, this is both for above and below the ground improvements that we need in the downtown area and the Walker's Brook area. It could be something as simple as parking above ground and water, sewer, storm water capacity underground. And again, $4 million of debt is planned. Um, the DPW building project, again, is a very complex situation. The math is very, very much in draft form. But we've put a placeholder uh, in the budget for 25-year uh, debt service beginning in FY22, and obviously we'll have extensive discussions well before that comes anywhere close. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the first stage of the building security, uh, we would suggest to move the $500,000 dispatch center up two years to next year, and we would defer 450000 of other improvements that we had been discussing and was <coughs> voted by the November uh, town meeting. So that's essentially a swap. I'm going to turn it over now to John to discuss uh, the Killam School. Sure, thank you. Um, before <coughs> before I begin, I I do want to um, give give a huge round of um, compliments to the facilities department for the work that they do <coughs> each and every day. Last night, I had Chief Sagala came and, and talked a little bit um, at the school committee meeting and. We talked about the strong relationship we have with, with our public safety, and I, we have a very similar relationship with our facilities department. And I just want to thank Joe and, and Kevin Kabuzi and Kevin Gerstner. Um, you know, along with Gail Dowd and I, we, we meet on a regular basis. We, we discuss what's going on in the schools and in the, the different projects that are going on, and they do a tremendous job in our schools. And having said that, um, I think you're going to see what is reflected in the report that was done by the Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, is that the buildings overall, the school buildings overall, um, are very well maintained um, and, and clean. So recently there was a report that was released by MSBA, Massachusetts School Building Authority. And for those of you that don't know, MSBA is uh, the prime um, state funding source when uh, there are school building projects going on. Uh, so when a, when a town is moving forward with a building project, um, depending on the community um, and depending on some of the parameters that are in the statute for MSBA, um, a certain percentage could be funded on that, on that school building project uh, and awarded by MSBA. We've had several projects over the years uh, funded uh, by uh, percentages funded by MSBA. So recently they released a 2016 school survey report. Um, that is on their website. Um, they are required periodically by the statute to conduct school surveys. 
to understand the building condition of all public schools. So essentially they went to every public school um, that was less than 10 years old um, in, in Massachusetts during the 2016 year. Uh, the last time that was completed was in 2010. Um, it should be noted though that that survey data that they do um, is only one of the many tools that they use when they determine um, an application is put on a list for funding. Um, and, be, and so they use that as just one, one piece of it. For Reading itself, seven of the eight schools were surveyed, Woodhead being the newest school and under 10 years old at the time was not, was not surveyed. Um, each building is given a rating on a, on a scale from one to four. One is the highest, four is the lowest. And it's given in two categories. One is for building condition and one is for general environment. All Reading sur schools surveyed receive a rate, received a rating of one or the highest score for general environment condition. So what's in this category? Um, the things that are in this category include learning environment, which is space and educational quality, building condition rating, cleanliness and maintenance, building safety, which includes school security and fire life safety, universal accessibility, which is site accessibility, building accessibility, academic sufficiency, which is the number of academic classrooms for the enrollment, program sufficiency, which is the presence of specialized room and core spaces like gymnasiums and libraries, art and music rooms, and instructional technology, so adequate Wi-Fi access, power infrastructure, and classroom technology. So every Reading school that was surveyed, six out of, uh, seven out of the eight, received a rating of one or the best rating in that category. In the building condition category, four of the seven schools, which is Barrows, the high school, Eaton, and Parker, received a rating of one, again, the highest rating. Coolidge and Birch Meadow received a rating of two, Killam received a rating of three. The criteria for this rating includes building analysis, roofing, exterior, oh, um, the exterior piece, um, and other in other areas that are, are critical to um, the conditions of, of, of that, the, the boilers, the HVAC, all of that. What they, they did not um, talk about with, with Killam is that there are definitely some, some things that Killam has that, that we know of that are some deficiencies right now that need to be addressed. So structurally, Killam is a very sound building. Um, and but it is showing, obviously, the wear and tear of a, a building that was built in 1969 and has not had any, any renovations to it. So what, what this means is, for the, from the MSBA point of view, is that MSBA under the statute has eight categories that they look at to prioritize whether or not a school goes on, on the list or not. And right now, Killam does not fit into any of the eight categories. So here's some of the categories that that would um, that the uh, statute talks about. One is to prevent severe overcrowding um, or uh, if you have a population bubble coming through, um, if you have a short-term um, enrollment growth, if you are replacing or adding to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs, uh, addressing racial imbalance, um, if the, the building itself in its current state is, is in an unhealthy condition that students should not be in the building at that time. Um, none of those categories right now would qualify Killam to be put on a list for MSBA funding. Now, we do know that Killam has some building deficiencies. Um, the biggest ones being handicap accessibility. Um, it, was, it was built in 1969 where the uh, ADA requirements were not um, in place. Uh, the lead in the water, which right now, um, over the last two years, we've worked very closely with the water department, and that has been safely mitigated with bottled water. Um, it does have aging windows and doors in the classrooms. Um, in addition to the uh, age of the building, there are some areas that do need to be updated um, and renovated. Um, there are some things like uh, the fire suppression system, which we do not have a fire suppression system at Killam. However, we do have an updated fire alarm panel, uh, which is actually for life safety, is, is a critical component. The fire suppression system is obviously put in place to protect par property where the life safety, the um, fire alarm panel is used to protect um, 
life and people. So, and and that still that still matches according to the, the current building code because there have not been major renovations um, done to kill them. So the next logical steps is we've had several conversations recently about um, what to do next with, with Killam is it really needs to have a feasibility study done on the building to see what are what are exactly the things that need to be done we know that some of them um, but obviously we would like to have some more information I think also Killam needs to look, be looked at as part of an entire elementary school um, plan in terms of are there other things that need to be done at the same time where Killam is going to get some work done anyway? Do we need to look at Killam as part of a larger elementary school issue that may surround space or, or other needs uh, that we have at our elementary levels? So the next logical step would be to do some sort of feasibility study um, under the guise, I would assume, of the Town Building Committee um, to, to move forward on that. This year uh, and for the plans for the future, the building committee has 150,000 as a budget, so that would certainly be a candidate even as soon as this year. Um, we've never built a building or done any work in that sense um, with the new building committee, so we'll kind of learn on the way. But um, you know, looking at the language of the building committee, it would be the schools committee that's the sponsoring agent and would have to make a request to the permanent building committee to kick off work, so to speak. And uh, you know, I've met sometimes with the building committee, certainly not as often as Joe. There's certain things they won't touch. Um, a new building or a study of a building or a renovation of a building is absolutely something they're interested in. Um, the remaining uh, building security improvements. Uh, at November town meeting, we had actually cut out uh, 450,000 of the basic uh, security improvements suggested to us and moved the funding up a year. Um, as, as especially John and I discussed the different ways to possibly do that and brought in uh, the police chief and the facilities director, the most logical thing to do first was the dispatch center, not anything else. So that's why we're suggesting that 450 get pushed back uh, and the dispatch center get, get done. That leaves the entire building security improvements uh, suggestion at just under $4 million. And finally, um, I won't go over this list in detail, but on the current capital plan is uh, almost uh, or just over eight and a half million dollars of Birch Meadow Field and high school athletic improvements. Um, and again, these items are suggested for this time by me uh, to be done outside the levy because there's just no chance that in the short run, meaning in the next five years, we could do all this work inside the levy. It's just not possible. Uh, to Mr. Brown's point, that doesn't mean that's how they end up being financed. That's just my suggestion right now to balance a budget. So as a debt exclusion? Yes. Okay. Before we move off, um, yeah. John, the report that you just shared with us that was not up there, you know, the, the study of the schools that was done independently? The MSBA report, yeah. yes. Can you, sh can you send that to us? Sure. Because there was a lot of really pertinent data you know, building by building and trying to keep up absolutely. with, with yeah. that was, no, absolutely. you know, I can do that. If you could send that to us, that would be great. Um, the other point, <coughs> excuse me, worth mentioning for the security improvements and then especially on this slide for the athletic improvements. Um, John and Joe and I have worked, mostly John and Joe have worked on uh, mitigation. So Joe has spent $30,000 this year on extending the life of some of these assets. So right now, um, this debt exclusion, if you will, is in the capital plan um, in FY21, two years from now. It doesn't have to be that soon. Uh, it can be pushed out. <coughs> and that's what we've been working on, is to not crowd in uh, the short-term needs with the longer-term needs. Um, whether that's, you know, the community's choice is, is up to the community. Uh, but none of these improvements are essential to be done in the next year or two. Where that's a list of seven, though, Bob, would you tackle some of them? I assume they don't all age at the same rate. You certainly could do them in any order, one at a time, uh, absolutely. So yeah. four of those are directly related to the school. The last two are somewhat indirectly related to the school because they aren't necessarily, that's more part of the Birch Meadow Master Plan, <coughs> would you say? Right. Because yeah. those are not property, I mean, Birch Meadow beyond 
kind of a demarcation line right. Is, right. is town kind of managed and controlled versus stuff inside, which I think is represented in those in those earlier bullets are really, you know, under school purview. Um, to that point, um, after some discussion after the last town meeting, um, I agreed with John and we moved uh, the four uh, items at the top into the core facilities budget and out of recreation because they're not under the care, custody, or control no. of the town in any they're sense. Not. And it was just an optics thing. We'd always put recreation stuff in recreation and not thought about it. But to your point exactly, those are moved under facilities. They belong to the school committee. Because I think for for people who are making decisions about how to vote and what they want to do, they need to have some clarity about how, you know who's managing what and how it's being done and how it's being used. Some general public, you know, and you know, interestingly, some of the stuff in the first four are being used heavily by the general, you know, public, but on a rental basis, you know, compared with the other, the last two, which are, you know, general public, but school used, not on a rental basis. So I, I think it's important to clarify that for those people who are making value judgments about what they want to do with their money, with their tax dollars. And um, on this list, I know the first one, two, three, four, five items quite well. Uh, Birch Meadow Phase Two is still being discussed by the Recreation mm -hmm. Committee. That's that one million is still an estimate. John, some questions on the MSBA. Um, sure. Maybe they they don't give you this clarity, but was the three on the high side of three, or is it? Did they give me an indication? With yeah, the they just give you the number three. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of, um, and maybe this is. I, I should have. I'm sorry. I should have pulled that when they did it in 2010. It was uh, Killam was a two. And my guess is that the biggest reason for that is the um, handicap accessibility in the lead, the lead in the water. And is there any guidance that they provide in terms of longevity, longevity or lifetime that's that's noteworthy in terms of the building, the utility of the building, the remaining op operating life? Do they make any comments like that, or it's purely about the current condition of the building? Um, it, it's the two categories that I mentioned: the general building condition and the environmental condition. So. Um, the environmental condition is a is a very strong rating, yeah. and it's the general building condition that was that was the three. Um, and in the categories that I mentioned, I mean, it's really those areas: the handicap accessibility, um, the fire suppression, the uh, the, the plumbing. Um, those those are the areas that. Do they address security in, in that report? That was in the other one, and we received a one. Okay. We have similar security in all of our. Uh, schools so when um, so when you send us that report any that anything you have that kind of probably sets the groundwork for how to understand the rating system would be, would be valuable the the report you're going to get is for all of Massachusetts it we didn't get a specific individual report for Reading so you got to go in and find the buildings Correct. And the yeah. master it's probably on the, I imagine you find it on there. It's right on the MSBA website, but I'll send you the, the I'll send it to Bob. And you can well, I just, I assumed because you were reading from a report. No, I'm reading it from my notes. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm saying. You, you homogenized <laughs> yes. the work. Yeah, I went I mean, through the report. Yes. I, that would be valuable. Just oh, I'll send you my save notes save us an then. enormous amount of <laughs> digging. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that you talked about is sort of like, okay, well, we didn't get onto the SBA list. We have to do an assessment. And, and Bob, you alluded to the fact that there is some money in the um, <coughs> building committee. Is that where you envision um, sort of that getting funded, or is that going to do we need to go outside of that, or is that enough to get that done? I would say um, process-wise, I mean this this ball is clearly in the school committee's court. Just to be clear, the funding is it? Um, there is. is you know, 150 this year, 150 next year of funding available is all I know. What it would cost, we've kicked around some numbers. We don't know what the right scope of work is. It, that could be sufficient. We don't know. Barry, if I can so just, you, if, I can just the if I can just if I can just clarify, yeah. we did not apply to go on a list. Right. What I'm reporting to you is how, by the statute, how MSBA prioritizes where a school right. falls. So we're not. Sort of we've not, we've not yet. No. We need to be a four, probably. To no, four. That, remember, that's just one tool that they use. Okay. This is a general information tool that, by statute, they're required to provide. Correct. Is right. what I, the, the way I understood it. The application process begins in January. So, 
is what I guess what I'm trying to, to call out from what you're saying is that because the building is, you know, it, it, it might be old, it's not necessarily in, in a poor condition that you think it would, we would rate high on their, uh, on their list? And yeah. The, the, therefore unlikely to get funding? The is good that? news is that we've done a good job maintaining our buildings. Mm -hmm. The bad, the bad, the <laughs> the bad, bad news bad. is that we've done a good job of maintaining our buildings. Um, and, you know, there are some deficiencies, as I mentioned earlier, with, with Killam, but um, not in the MSBA's eyes is it a higher priority well, you know, than other in schools. In a general way, you've got a building that's 48 years old. Correct. I don't care how well you've maintained it. Right. You know, it, it, I mean, if you think about this in the private sector, that building was a zero at 30 years old. And then if you look at every other building that's on that report, you know, major overhauls have gone on, or or builds have Correct. gone on, well within that depreciable period. So the one, you know, jumps out at you. It's 48 years old, right. and you can maintain all you want, but if you think about it on a on a normal depreciation schedule, it's, um, it's yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. There. The 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 question is is does MSBA to receive funding? That's that's the question. Well, so there's funding. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, almost for a minute, you have to put aside. I, I know we can never put aside the funding, but you have to for a second and let common sense step in and say, you have a 48-year-old building, and, and you've, we've done a good job maintaining it. Therefore, in somebody's list, they're not reading it as a, as a teardown. Um, so, but there's a practical application here that says you got something major you know, brewing over there um, that is going to need attention. Absolutely, which is why we need to do a feasibility study right. to see what are all the issues that we need to address. John, John you said I think to, to John's point, you want options. Yeah. That's not something that has been our strong suit on the past building projects. Um, we want to know what are the different paths we might take well, I forward. I think that's kind and of have what we're that hoping for the, the building community. committee is options. Right. Yeah, that's so the idea. We've never had right. really that's before. John, you've mentioned in the past that that building, you know, one of the deficiencies, I think, is it has something to do with the lack of an office as you walk in the front door. There's like a, usually a central office when you walk into a public school. I, I guess that particular facility, it's quite tiny. Or it's a tiny, it's a tiny area, yes. So they've already analyzed the, you know, the 1969 standards, I'm guessing, were different than you would do it today. They've already built, they've already baked that into that number three. So it's all, all kind of rolled into that number three. This is too small, that's not there, but that, that yes. still gets you a three. Yes. Public comment. Yes, why don't you John, come out uh, up just, John, just? I'm sorry, Andrew. I, I just want to get one thing clear, John. So I, I get it, we're not getting any state money. Um, no, I didn't say that. I just, it, you don't go higher on the list compared to other buildings. Okay. I'm just stating what MSBA, right. all I'm stating tonight is facts, okay. not, a, not no, any no, no, opinions. I, I, I'm just trying to, <laughs> trying to. So we would but, still but apply, right? What's, okay. <laughs> yes, we yes. So, so what, what, what sort of. So there are these deficiencies. What sort of timeline, and, and you're thinking of doing a feasibility study, how long does do these feasibility studies take, and when do you think the deficiencies would be corrected, roughly? Like a year, two years, three years? I, I don't have those answers, and I think though that's information that I think a feasibility study would tell us. I'm Jennifer Kane. I'm a Killam mom. I have two girls at Killam and then a little two-year-old boy who'll be at Killam. Uh, and I looked up this report and I read this whole report and I downloaded all the schools into a spreadsheet and I analyzed the report. Do you know the percentage of schools in the entire state, 1,500 schools, the percentage that got a four, 1.2%. It was 15 schools that got a four in the entire state. The percentage that got a three, 15% of schools in the entire state. We are the bottom 16% of schools. And also the high school was rated a three when we got funding for the high school. Really was floored by that number, and I hope you are too. We are the lowest 16%. If we were hoping for a four, we were hoping for the lowest 1%. I just, I'm very upset about it. And I hope that we do something before we do something about fields because to see all the numbers written out there about fields, have you seen the Killam field? <laughs> but that's not even our top problem. We need help, please help us. John, relative to the, the question rolled up in that comment, is, is there a way to, I guess, uh, uh, 
apply or otherwise um, take the path that we did when the high school project was kicked off at a level three? Just, just for a point of fact, the high school was under a, a different set of uh, statutes with MSBA. At MSBA time. has I now see. changed I see. Thank you. its whole um, process. Okay. So, so I, I guess maybe the question is that if, if that is true, if Pilum is in the bottom 16%, what how many buildings do they fund a year and is it conceivable and assuming that they actually go in the in, in that order is that one year is that two years is that 20 years yeah there's you know? um there's a there's an amount of, in the statute there's an amount of money that is provided each year and it there's a i think it's a, a percent of the state sales tax is used to fund the school building construction each year and by statute there's a i think it's one percent or something like that right. um, so they have that pool of money each year and there's a list of schools that and so the until the funding dries up is is who gets funded for the public comment yes ma'am Yes, okay. but so Killam is not overcrowded. Killam has trailers outside for kindergarten students. It's affordable class for vacant school. Right, but that that's not deemed overcrowding by MSBA. So why why do we need trailers if it's not overcrowded? We have we have classroom space, yes. but our classroom space is used for different things, and we do need the two modules for kindergarten. That is true, right. but the space is also used for other areas like special education programs, art and music classrooms, and general classrooms. Okay. Um, and then the last one is more of a statement, is that even though there is mitigation for lead in the water, I think the basic just foundation of people who drink from the water fountain should be very important in consideration whether we have to the Thank you. Other comments? Uh, we get an answer on that inside, outside the levee? Bob? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Finance Committee has some guidelines of what belongs inside and outside the levy. Um, generally speaking, a large building project, for instance, just doesn't fit inside the levy. It's too much money. Um, we have a certain amount of money we can spend on debt and capital every year. Um, Twelve or fifteen years ago, uh, Barrows and uh, um, Wood End were done mostly inside the levy, and it killed our capital plan for years. And our equipment and some of our uh, you know, vehicles went into severe disrepair, causing operational issues um, for maintenance. So FinCom developed a policy to prevent that in the future and said, you know, if, if a project is X or larger, it belongs going to the voters as a debt exclusion. It's just too large to fit inside the levy. Rules are made to be changed, though. Any discussion can be had. And we have other Yes. Go. Why don't, you, why don't you stand up, Excuse though? We, mic, people are having trouble hearing you. Yeah. Uh, uh, John, am I correct that the wealth of the community also comes into the SB, MSB funding? Uh, as far as um, the percent, the percent reimbursement. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that is true. But yeah. not necessarily if you go on the list or not.
um, and, and many people here do remember that I, I would be surprised that maybe a three and a four are a different thing now because that was SBA and this is MSBA, but certainly you know, the condition of that high school building, um, it hadn't been maintained. We, did, we were right. not maintaining our buildings then. And so um, I think that it's, that's an important note we do realize that we need to move forward with it. It's going to have to be something that we figure out how to fund the feasibility study. Um, and just to make sure the water, there is dr drinkable water at Killam School in bubblers. It's bottled water. Um, and that will be the condition before we, we can uh, obviously do something in the building to rectify that. So there is drinking water accessible to students and staff. Hey, the public comment. Yes, sir. Come on up. Just introduce yourself and tell us what's on your mind. Hey, I'm Nick Marangoni. I have a student at Killam and I don't want to go. Um, Dr. Dari, uh, the MSBA study, did that, does that consider the surrounding areas and getting students to and from the school and how they get dropped off and such? That's part of one of the rate. That's the, um, I believe that was the general. That's the general environment condition, I believe. Yeah, that's the general environment which we received a one. Okay, because doing it every day, I see it's a big problem. And so I would encourage this study, a uh, feasibility study, to consider that in ways to improve that. Sometimes it can take 15 minutes in traffic uh, to drop a student off. And that, that's really tough. Thank you. Other public comments? Mark? Mark Docks here. Uh, just piggybacking on Elaine's point for a moment. Um, I think we've also learned that when we underfund and underestimate on feasibility studies, it comes to bite us at a, a big multiple afterward. And I just wonder what the mechanism would be if we decide in as soon as we can that we're going to need more money. Um, how would that take place? Ideally, it happens before town meeting, before the budget closes, we can fit it in. But what would the process be? Does it come through the permanent building committee that they're first of all, the school committee will come forward with a project. Once the project's there, um, what's the process from there to figure out what it will be, how much it will cost, and then how to make sure we can get it in to this budget cycle? Um, I would suggest, uh, quite honestly, that the school committee meet with the permanent building committee. Um, they have a meeting on, I believe it's January 8th, that's booked to talk about the library project. They're usually pretty good about meeting when they need to. Uh, their next meeting scheduled would be early February. Uh, that's probably in enough time with respect to the budget process if it comes a meeting during the month of February. So you know, that's a possibility. Other comments? Yes, ma'am. Come on up. first grade teacher at Killams. Um, I think that we've done a pretty good job. We were able to get a new roof years ago. We were able to get a new heating system years ago. Um, but the lead in the water is a huge concern. And although we have drinkable water in the bubblers, there's a lot of time on learning that is lost sending kids to the bubblers. Um, and I teach first grade, so they're very little. And they're, you know, at the beginning of the year where it was really warm, a lot of the bubblers are running out. So then you're trying to get the custodians to refill the bubblers and sending the kids halfway across the building to another bubbler. This is just a lot of educational time being missed because of those bubblers. So I think that the lead in the water, I think, is a huge concern as a school that that's something that we'd really like to see rectified. And I understand that's a huge undertaking and it's so much money that if there's something to prioritize, that's something that, you know, we really would like to consider. Other public comments? <coughs> Okay. So, John, I have a... Yes, Barry. So can, can you just lay out sort of what... Uh, I'm trying to wrap my arms around the process. So the SBA process, you said, is not necessarily off the table. Or, or, so will no. there be a formal application that's done? Uh, do, they, do they request proposals at a certain time? Jan January, um, it's usually the first week in January that they begin their application process for two programs. One is for... for building projects and one called uh, accelerated repair which are things like boilers and roofs so we're gonna we're gonna go down that path right, right, right. Uh, that would be a decision that the school committee would need to make so that's not uh, so it's not an either or we can go down that path see where that goes we can also do our own assessment and at the end of the day 
will have options, right? So that, that is true, okay. yes. So it's not one or the other. It could be Correct. parallel tracks. Okay. So. John, I just want to understand the feasibility, funding the feasibility project, and this goes to you too, Bob, I guess, the process and the timing. So if that's to be funded for FY19, um, is that to be funded for FY19? And if it's to be funded for FY19, how do we get in the budget in time to fund? Um, I can answer the beginning of that. Um, currently in FY18, there is 150,000 that the permanent building committee has. Um, proposed in FY19 and passed by November town meeting for what it's worth is another 150,000 next year. So those two things, you know, one is a fact, one is a proposal. Right. Um, anything that's above and beyond that or a different time frame would have to be a change going through town meeting. But there's enough to get started now on something. Absolutely. You'd okay. certainly think so, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Other public comment? Yes, Michelle. Michelle Sampi, Precinct 6. Um, yeah, I want to kind of make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. I understand that there's an application process that could start in January, but I also understand that we need a feasibility study and that we want to be very thoughtful of the scope of it so that we're learning from past mistakes and past successes. So my understanding is that we wouldn't be submitting an application until the school committee met with the, the, the board, the building, the building committee. Building, thank you very much. The building committee and they went through that process and then you would determine if the funding was available and if we didn't have the 150 if we were over that then we would have to find out where we would get that money so because it kind of feels like we're jumping ahead and that there are a lot of steps so i'm just looking for the clarification i guess i think there's two different paths which i think Bar what barry was alluding to the feasibility study um if the school committee and met with the school building committee and that they felt that's the direction to go was something that could be started sooner. The MSBA right. process is a much more lengthier process that could take a few years. But it, would it, it doesn't strike me, and I humbly, to make sense to start that process until we have a feasibility study. Um, MSBA has certain requirements before to begin a process. Um, that's something that we would have to study carefully when the application is out. Thank you. Other public comment? Deadline of this application. April. Okay. Seeing none. April for what, this. Do they yeah. roll, John? So it's like, you know, you have to start. The, um, for the, the program that I was referring to, the deadline is in April. Okay. So for the accelerated repairs, I believe the deadline is in February, but we, that would not be for what we're looking at. So if we don't have enough information to submit an app, you know, kind of a, a thoughtful application, we're really waiting another year. Hmm. For MSBA. Mm -hmm. MSBA. And, and with the MSBA, that is to be put on a list to eventually receive funding if you get the approval of the community to move forward in a, with a renovation or a new building. So that's here. We're talking. That's, yeah, that's to get put on a list to get a percent right. of funding. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a few year process. <clears throat> Assuming it all works out, that's what? You just described a three or four year it's a process. It's a multi-year process, yes. Dan? Uh, Bob, is there not some requirement the town meeting act in some capacity before this it gets started up as an official project started by the school committee? Uh, they have to declare it a project. That's a good question. I'd have to look uh, Before the uh, building committee can <coughs> take formal think, action on it. I don't think a feasibility study would require that, but anything beyond that would. Yeah. Okay. And I'd have to really reread the bylaw. The, like the building committee also well, has their own policies and procedures. January for school projects. So that may be also what we're both thinking of. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. The feasibility study is to look at options that we have that we might undertake on our own, but it doesn't necessarily inform us relative to the MSBA path. Correct. It might, but, but it's not designed to. No, you're right. All right, thank you. We may decide to do something on our own, which is the question, about, you know, before MSBA even kicks in. Other public comments? George. Uh, yeah, George Katchen, and as you well know, you know, I'm new to this game. But it seems to me that we should determine what is the most actionable thing that we can do right now to start the process. And it seems that you said it, Bob, that it's the school committee and the building committee to get together. 
So if there's school committee and building committee people in here, I think that should be a number one thing on their next agenda. Because it would seem to me before you do anything, you need a feasibility study, you know what the issues are, or go further into what the issues are. But you know, what is the most actionable item that can be done to start the process and not wait for one or two years? Another public comment. Vanessa. Um, the, the biggest answer is it's further away and very complex. I have no idea how many towns would join, what it would cost. Um, but I will say, even though the project may be large and comparable to Killam, it will be split, first of all, it will be split by communities, and secondly, within Reading, it would be split by the three enterprise funds and the general fund. So the share paid by the general fund is, is certainly smaller than a Killam, for instance. But that doesn't mean that that couldn't also be proposed as a debt exclusion down the road. Okay. Um, regarding the feasibility study, what exactly does that entail? Is that all of the options? Would that be specific to kill them? Because 150000 doesn't strike me as a lot given the number of projects that I've heard discussed. <laughs> So there's different types of studies. The feasibility study would be more of a general information gathering study. This is that's different than a design right. study, a full design of a if you're going to move forward with a with a building renovation or addition. So with the feasibility, we would actually set the parameters for what we would want in the feasibility study. So what are the what are the areas that need to be looked at with Killam? What are the different options that are available to us? Um, do we need to look at um, all five elementary schools at the same time mm -hmm. um, is is part of a you know a multi-school solution. Those are all the things that I would I would assume would be something we would want to look at, one. and then we would have all the information um, to make a decision that would be the best for the community. Thank you. Um, and my last question is, when and how are we going to be discussing of all of these items that are mentioned? What the priority? have the athletic fields, we have the building security, and we have Killam, but what we haven't talked about is the time, we know that these need to happen within 10 years, but what we haven't talked about is which affects the residents the most, um, and in what order we want to do them in. Um, so I'm curious when that discussion is going to happen. I can start answering that question. The um, uh, athletic field improvements uh, were put into the capital plan last November with an expectation of when they were needed. So the con fields were in certain conditions. Uh, they were needed to be repaired within two years. As I mentioned earlier, that's now been extended to three or four years. Kill them, we had no idea. No idea what MSBA would say um, and where the path may lead. Um, and then the building security improvements, um, you know, you can do them tomorrow, you can never do them. That's a community choice. Um, I would assume that that's um, a, set, a series of community meetings ending up with town meeting making a decision. Um, the soonest any of these are uh, currently is two years away, and I'm suggesting that those ones can even be pushed out to three or four. So honestly, I would say any of these are on the table for the first priority. It's a community decision. Um, I assume that the uh, school committee, the selectmen, and the FinCom in a financial <coughs> form would have that discussion, and ultimately town meeting would decide on funding and possibly the voters. Thank you. For the public comment. John, Bob, any other comments? Uh, not on this. <laughs> <laughs> Just to finish off the shared costs, uh, benefits are also not changed uh, since the financial forum. I did share with the selectmen some good news on health insurance that's m probably more of a long-term thing. Um, our, our PEC, our collection of town, school, and light department unions, uh, did vote to make a very aggressive change on retirees, on certain retirees, which will get them into uh, Medicare sooner uh, they, than they otherwise would have. Uh, the town will pick up a share of that cost and save hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road uh, annually. 
Um, the other thing is that our experience, if you will, our, our, our healthiness is actually uh, at an all-time high. I'm sure I'll regret saying that, but yeah. for the first time in the Maya pool, we're one of the most healthy groups. I'm quite sure I'll regret that, but uh, that's not always been the case. We tend to be an older workforce. All public sector is older than private sector, but Reading in particular has tended to be an older workforce than other uh, municipalities over the years. Um, so again, that's, that's the biggest driver of the operating budget problem is our benefits. 7.5% um, at this point for health insurance is still a wild guess. All we know is when Maya announces a range in the fourth week of January, we should be towards the low end. Um, national trends, we were told as of a month and a half ago, were double digits. Who knows? I can't solve that. I just don't know. Bob, just to go back to that slide, I think it's important point out that um, <coughs> the group health life insurance increase from FY17 to FY18 went up almost 4.5%. Mm -hmm. And um, Prop 2.5 only allows us to grow our income at about 2.5% plus some new, new growth. So um, I just wanted to highlight that line. Yeah, over a long period of time, um, our health insurance compared to private health insurance annually has behaved, ex behaved exceptionally well, but way more than 2.5%. So we might be at a long-term average of about 4 when the country's at 8 or 9. Mm -hmm. We can't do better than that. We won't in the future do as well as that. But to your point, even a 4 is bad news for a municipality. Um, we do have some of our uh, my colleagues that are getting double digits and have for the last few years, and they're being crushed. Um, There's a municipality not too much unlike us. It is a city. Um, they spend almost 20% of their budget on health insurance. We're closer to 10. So just think about that math. And Bob, I think it's important. You've mentioned this to the to the selectmen many times, um, and, and I know with FinCon, but I think it's helpful to point out to folks in the room and and on, and on who are watching. Um, the, what Reading contributes um, toward its employees' health insurance, how that compares to the employees, uh, the, uh, to its employees, employees contribute, um, and what the employees contribute. I think that there may be some um, sort of um, folks out there thinking that we're sort of overly generous with our benefits. And I know you've mentioned it to us many times. I think it's worth repeating kind of how we stand yeah. relative to the private sector in general. The employees, generally speaking, don't think we're overly generous. <laughs> Um, the town pays 71% of the premiums. The employees or the retirees pay 29%. Um, averages within our peer communities is starting to approach 75-25, but historically has been 80-20 or worse. There are still some communities that are 90-10. Yeah. Um, the other part I didn't mention, but I will now, is our, our PEC, which is, again, the collection of all the school, town, and light department unions has been a really good partner. You know, again, they're a 29% partner. We're a 71. Our objectives are the same. Um, they have made significant plan designs. That 4% did not happen by accident. Right. We have shifted many costs under the consumer of health insurance uh, within our uh, employment base. With their permission. And another thing worth mentioning, a few years ago, we had one of these budget meetings at the Light Department, and I remember um, we went into a lot more detail on HR and things, some things like this than usual. Uh, just so people are clear on pensions, um, all employees hired within the last 10 or 15 years fully fund their own pensions. Um, we have between 9 and 11% of our salary taken out to fund the pension. The reason that there are some unfunded liabilities is for things that happened 25 and 30 years ago. Um, this, um, actually the retirement board just met today. I believe the pension fund will be fully funded somewhere around 20,029 or 28. Um, at that point, this number for retirement will drop off by over a million dollars. And that's just the catch-up for when towns paid 100% of pensions and employees did not pay anything. And you do that for a number of decades, and it's really expensive in the future as long as they're alive. Um, we are in significantly better shape going forward for the pension. Um, as we've discussed with FinCom, our um, OPEB, which is health insurance for retirement, uh, needs more funding. You know, contributing 500,000 a year is, is much better than most communities. Um, we should be contributing a million and three quarters in order to defease that liability over a long period. How, how big is that liability now, Bob? Last I heard, it was about 80 million. Is that ballpark? On the 
up there. I mean, if I was coming in evaluation, that was somewhere near seventy million. It's worse now because they don't give you the right discount rating if you're not funding to the um, annual required contribution. So, so, the, so the thinking and the planning has been um, for a long time. As soon as the need to fund pensions at that high level goes away, we can shift that funding over okay. into OPEP. Okay. Uh, ideally, you'd like to do it sooner, but obviously we can't afford to do that. And the government has sort of moved that liability yes. to the balance sheet where it used to be off book. And so right. kind of as a way to kind of hit you over the head to remind yourself that you need to yes. put this in. And also the rating agencies look at look at that. So yes. correct. So we've maintained a AAA bond rating, if I'm not mistaken, that is correct. because we've sort of done the right thing. But even by doing the right thing, we're still a little behind. A lot yeah, and our light department, our water, sewer, and stormwater enterprises are fully funding their OPEB liability. It's just the general fund just frankly can't afford it. Um, lastly, in terms of a lot of miscellaneous costs, the only change um, John and I discovered a, a week or two ago, there's uh, extra students at Essex North that neither one of us knew about. Uh, we'll have to increase the budget for FY19. Uh, the budget for FY18 at 38,000 is half of what we need. We may have surplus in the other two Vogue School lines to absorb that. If we don't, we'll be going to April town meeting. But it's interesting that we don't know how many students we have at a school because they can't count <laughs> or they don't tell us. Um, the, the primary well, school in Wakefield history. does a one year lag, so they know. Uh, we know at the end of a school year that next year will be X because it's a fact. The others depend on enrollment during the year, which they don't know until about December. They just don't happen. So they just got a approval for a new building. Correct. What will that cost us? That's a really good question. Um, MSBA is reimbursing some large share. I think Chelsea, they do it by the community that has the highest reimbursement rate, I think. That's what it used to be. Uh, Chelsea has the highest reimbursement rate as of a few years ago, somewhere in the mid-70s. Oh. Yeah, so the rest of the, the 12 communities are going to have to pay, let's say, 25% of a new building, which I'm sure is $100 million plus. And that will be divided up by enrollment, which is a great benefit for Reading. So I made sure of that last summer when they talked about it. It will cost us money. It will have to come into the capital plan somewhere. I really don't have a good number for you, but it's not a showstopper. It's, it's a minor inconvenience, if you will. Well, I mean, in a relative way, it's a lot of money, but it's a small percentage. Yeah, um, um, because the, the forecast I saw was that it'll be a two hundred million dollar building. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. How does it come into the capital plan? Is debt, Bob? You just pay it um, over time. That's a really good question. I don't know. Do you know, John? I don't know. How can the government take money over time? They I'm guessing it'll be part of our assessment that you see in this line. Oh, it'll yeah. just be capital right. in addition to operations. That's right. a guess. Okay. But of course, we're good. That would go. That would be a capital expense, and we do that. It'll be off the top as an accommodated Correct. cost, whatever whatever it is. Um, but for those that want to see what a MSBA priority school is, go visit the Vogue School in Wakefield, and you get your answer. The kids have kept that building together for at least ten years. <laughs> it, or, yeah, or longer. A, um, their senior project. So, uh, yes. Uh, Bob, um, I'm sorry, the, so the survey comments are looming large uh, in my my cortex right now. <laughs> And uh, uh, the phrase, live within your means, was repeated uh, many times, more than I can count. <clears throat> but my point is, or what my question is this, for the health insurance uh, costs, um, is it fair to say that we're giving our employees, both te munis and teachers, um, some salary increases, steps, and, and cost of living? But um, on the health benefit side, that's not a full like three percent raise. Say they're gonna, they have to pay more out in medical care costs. Is that correct? Yeah. If um, I, I haven't done this math lately, but for many years, the salary increases received by most employees did not pay for the increase in their health insurance costs. So they get twenty nine percent of whatever the increase is. <coughs> passed along directly to them <coughs> as a monthly cost. Um, their raise may or may not have covered that, frankly. So it's hurt, uh, it, it, as, a, as a town, it hurts us, but they're also- Both the town and employee are highly motivated initiated. to minimize that cost, yes. Get to the gym. Okay, thanks. Yep. 
Any other public comment? We're coming here to the end of the evening, so this is an opportunity to ask any questions that might have lingered. Okay, that's all we have for tonight. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, before we go, uh, Caitlin sent out a packet for tomorrow. There is a settlement in there you should take a yes. look at if you haven't had yeah, a chance to look that. at it yet. Just want to remind Great, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and just let me say a few words about it to, so it's clear. Yeah, um, this is money that a trucking company is agreeing to pay the fire department or to pay Reddit. Right. There was an oil spill or a spill up on 128. The fire department incurred some costs. Uh, there is case law and state law that says the c truck company could pay. They have lawyers. We have lawyers. Yep. We're settling for a partial payment, but a pretty good settlement. So how, how old is that event? Uh, it's within the last six months, I think. Is Paul still at West Cork? When did it happen? Last winter? Oh, it's getting older. Okay. So, so this is money we're getting. This yeah. is a reimbursement. Well, we're going to talk about it tomorrow, just to heads up. And, and also in your packet, the, uh, you received the enterprise fund budgets, much like you received the general fund budget in the past. Uh, Jeff will go over the Motion to adjourn. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, for those at home, and to echo the comments of my uh, colleague at the end of the table, one of the comments in our Board of Selectmen survey was regarding the communication style, the communication level, and the context for town budgets. Tonight is the third in four meetings that will discuss town budgets, the components within them. They uh, anticipated growth in those numbers as we roll up to include both our budget discussion as well as a potential ballot question. I'd urge you, if you have any questions, to make a point of attending tomorrow night's meeting or getting your questions sent in to a, a proxy. We're very interested in hearing what you have to say. We're, very, we're preparing this material for the public's consumption, both so they understand and that they have a basis to make a decision on any future questions that come come forward. So with that, John, I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, just to clarify also what is and what is not going to happen tomorrow night, um, Jeff Zager will describe uh, DPW's budget request, both in the general fund and all the enterprise funds. <coughs> and I have some concluding remarks about uh, the process going forward. Um, the board and the community will not see a balanced budget tomorrow night on purpose. The superintendent and I have <coughs> discussed the process. Um, we both believe the best answer, I'm sorry he's not here to agree, but trust me, <laughs> is to us both release a balanced budget in the first week of January. That's what he's going to do to the school committee. That's what I'll do to the community. Um, and then um, in some way, shape, or form, we'll indicate what did not make the budget and what are our priorities to add back should revenue become available. But Bob, so tomorrow night will be the, you know, the sort of fourth of four, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the municipal side. Um, I know I've just gained an incredible amount of knowledge of how the town operates and some of the risks that are actually we've been taking by not funding certain things over a period of time. Is tomorrow night at the end of that an appropriate time for the five of us to kind of talk about what we learned, some of the things we would like to kind of see that goes into that? Or, or are, you, are you seeking input from us? I, I would hope that. <laughs> Mm, I guess I better answer that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, your input's always welcome. I've specifically carved out time on your January 9th agenda to have this discussion. I didn't know how prepared you'd be tomorrow. We can start it tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, tonight I just learned a ton of stuff I didn't know. So, yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> Less than a year. So you, you're balanced by... They have my attention. <laughs> So you're, ba the ba you're, the, the ba you're proposing to give a balanced budget after January 9th? After uh, no, before January 9th. Before. You'll see it in time for the January 9th. <coughs> and you'll see the list of, if you will, what didn't make the cut. Right. And, and at that point, our comments can... Um, I yeah. think it might be valuable if tomorrow night you spend a little time um, just reflecting on the process this right. year and what you learned. Yeah. I will tell you I've learned some things. If I had a balanced budget a week and a half ago, it's not the same as what it will be right. when I ultimately do it. Well, I'm glad you learned stuff, because I yeah. feel like I'm the only one that's sort of behind <laughs> no, the, I did. the curve here. So. As, as you probably learned, our department has are very shy about asking for more money. Yes. And by forcing this discussion, if you will, they are forced to discuss the things they don't get and why. And I learn things, because they don't always have the same, you know, really? thorough discussion, honestly, with us in private. Right. Well, it's a very, very valuable process. I mean, basically what we've done is we've lifted the hood. Yeah. And people can poke around and see what's under the hood. 
that's always valid. Well, it'll also come back in the discussion on priorities that will occur in January. So this will help be the foundation for that discussion as well. Well, I, I guess off to, to Barry's point, do we do we want to tomorrow night discuss priorities um, for Bob moving forward towards a balanced budget, or do we want to do it? Way around. I expect the town manager will prepare a list of priorities that are for consideration. We could choose to do whatever we want with it, but I would expect that would be presented to us um, tomorrow night's probably a little too soon, but I would think in January. Right. Yeah. right. And, you know, in the past, that's what we've done. Bob brings yeah. something, um, and then, you know, we consult with him based on that, and that has changed. Right. So, for example, you know, one of the examples of that is. Uh, the economic development director was not in the mix right. of one of your budgets, and you know after after council back and forth, it went in. So I mean, I, I think it's I think it's easier to get a look at it from Bob's perspective, and then we'll have time once he. I'm assuming you're not you're going to give that to us days in advance of the yeah, ninth Thursday meeting. before the ninth. Right. So will. I mean, so we'll have three four yeah. days to be able to look at it, and then and that'll have the narrative that you wrote. Yeah, that we can yeah. engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. Or no, <laughs> probably not. That's, That's a lot of FinCom. Um, you try to do that tomorrow night. I think you're. What I think would you're be helpful for tomorrow night? Aiming. I'll lay out some sort of guiding principles. Yeah that I'm using. Yeah. Um, it would be helpful if you'd comment on those and either disagree or agree or add some right, things. That'd be most welcome. As opposed to discussing certain line items, right. which might not be as valuable. Right. No, that, that wasn't my yep. intent, Bob. Okay. More, more approach. Guide, guide, yeah, yeah. General approach. Okay. Um, but much, much preferred to have you be the bad guy. <laughs> it's my job. Okay. <laughs> With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Very, very motion. Second. Mr. Halsey seconds. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Five zero. We are out. Good evening, everybody. Tell the truth. Drive safe. Even when I lie. That's a lot better than last week. It was 11 o'clock.